Hey there, welcome to Online at Five, the online service for Devonport Church of Christ. My name is Blake Moore and I'm the senior pastor here at Devonport Church of Christ. And whether you are a regular part of our church family or whether you are new, we just want to extend a very warm welcome to you today. Our church at Devonport Church of Christ, we are just an ordinary bunch of people who have discovered the grace, love and forgiveness of Jesus and the purpose that is found in Him. And we'd love to know that you're connecting with us today. Uh, And if you're new, you can send us a message through our church website or through our church Facebook page. Hey, you can even say hello right now in the chat and uh, somebody will will connect with you right now and uh, help you to connect to our church. We have two Sunday uh, on-site services every Sunday at 9am and and 10.30am. And so we'd love to maybe one day to be able to meet you in person. Our service today, we're going to about to go into a time of praise and worship, and then that's going to be followed up by an inspiring, relevant, uh, biblical message that I know is going to impact your life and your circumstances. So enjoy today's service. Uh, I know it's going to bless your life, and if you have any questions, just contact us, and we would love to discover how we can serve you and your family. God bless you. Thank you.
heavens, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and Suffered and crucified, forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus oh, I believe in you I believe you rose again I believe that Jesus Christ I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, when we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal, I believe in the virgin birth, I believe in the saints coming. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Hi Church, I'm so excited to be with you all today. My name is Ali and I work for Open Doors Australia. It's such an honour for me to be here sharing a few stories from the persecuted church with you all. I pray that these stories will both encourage and challenge your faith as you follow Jesus here in Australia. Today I'll be sharing some stories of our persecuted brothers and sisters throughout the world, reflecting on some of their struggles, their triumphs, their hopes, and most importantly, their passion for Christ in the midst of it all. I believe, and I'm sure you would all agree with me, that the message of the persecuted church has never been more relevant to the Australian believer than it is right now in this season. 
It's during times like this that we are given a beautiful opportunity to stop and come back to some basic questions. Do I know Jesus well? And how can I make him known in a time like this? In our generation, Australians may never have faced restrictions like the ones we're experiencing right now. However, it is a great opportunity for us to look to our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world as mentors to our faith, to learn from their lives and stories and witness growth in our own faith as we practice the lessons we learn from their testimonies. Firstly, I just want to thank anyone who has been already or supporting the persecuted church through the ministry of Open Doors. Whether that's been through your finances or through prayer, we truly are one body with many parts. And to support one another, even from the other side of the world, is more powerful than you may ever even have a chance to realize. And for those who have not heard of Open Doors before or the work we do throughout the world, I'm honored to share with you about our ministry today and show you how you can hold hands with the persecuted church as we see the gospel spread all over the world, no matter the cost. I personally have been working for Open Doors for just over nine months now. It has been the wildest journey of growing in faith, in prayer, in courage, and in understanding the heart of God through daily hearing the incredible testimonies of those following Jesus in the most difficult and confrontational conditions. Open Doors has worked for over 65 years in church communities that are being persecuted around the world, ensuring that rather than leaving, they can be equipped to stay and continue spreading the gospel and outreaching, outreaching into their wider communities. You see, one thing that I saw in Open Doors that is different to so many other charities and organizations is merely the fact that Open Doors doesn't exist to end a primary issue. You see, unlike many ministries that focus on ending poverty or, or sex trafficking, which is incredible, Open Doors itself doesn't exist to end persecution. Persecution, as we all know, is very biblical. In fact, it's the aspect of the gospel that continually propels it forward. So we as a church, our job is never to end persecution or even to try and stop it growing. It's to help give people the strength to stand firm in the face of it and shine as brightly as they can. Because wherever the gospel is being shared, persecution will exist. And as confronting as a thought that that can be for us here in Australia, who have never been exposed to something harsher than potentially a negative word for our faith, I want to encourage you that alongside this persecution is the continual evidence of the goodness of God. I was reading a story from the field recently. It was a very short testimony that left me in awe. A mother and secret believer in Afghanistan, shared, I have seven children. One of them was disabled and could not walk. When I brought the New Testament into my house, my daughter for the first time started to move. I began to read from the Bible and she started to walk. <laughs> what an amazing story that in the midst of extreme persecution, violent threats, and at times forced isolation in order to remain safe, Jesus makes himself evidently known through beautiful signs and wonders, drawing the lost straight to himself. Probably one of the most significant stories I have heard from the persecuted church that has been such a personal encouragement to me, particularly in this season that we're in, is that of a Chinese brother whose name is Wang Ming Dao. Now, Wang Ming Dao is considered by many to be the greatest, if not one of the greatest, revivalists in the history of the church in China. He is largely responsible for the rapid growth of Christianity in China that we have witnessed over the past few decades. In 1955, Wang Mingdao was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison, but he was told that he could go free 
if he signed a confession to say that he was not a Christian and was stopped speaking about God. He actually signed that confession and walked away from the prison. But only a few steps away from the gate, he stopped and realized he had made a terrible mistake. He turned around and walked back into the prison and told them to rip up the confession and take him back in. He spent many of those 22 years in solitary confinement. He stated that when he was put in jail, he was devastated because he was an evangelist. However, he quickly realized that he could actually preach down the pit toilet in the corner of his cell as all the sewage pipes were linked and sound carried throughout them. So he made this his preaching platform. And over seven years, he converted 96 people. <laughs> How amazing. He shared that he had no Bible, no pulpit, no audience, no pen or paper. He said, I could do nothing, nothing except get to know God. And for 20 years, that was the greatest relationship he ever knew. He stated, when I was in the cell, the only thing I was focused on was getting to know Jesus Christ. It was only me and him in that cell. And today he encourages believers to build yourself a cell where it's only you and Jesus. You see, I'm personally a pretty hard optimist. I think it's hard not to be when you get to know Jesus and you see him write beauty even over some of the hardest and messiest stories. I think just as our brother suggested, during this time, we have the great opportunity to turn our homes, our lounge rooms, our bedrooms into a prison cell where it's just us and him. The government has freed our time, removed our distractions and given us a space for as individuals to get to know God. I also have loved the challenge from Wong Wing Dao's life of how can I turn my pit my situation, my inconvenient moments into a pulpit? What new platforms are there to discover to make Jesus known during this time? And am I willing to lay down my desire to spend with other people and embrace a moment in a season of time to spend with the Lord? And like our brother, discover the greatest relationship that we could ever know. You see, one thing I witnessed as a strong part of life in the persecuted church is the willingness of individuals to say yes to Jesus. As one of the brothers in Central Asia said, we are willing to give our lives for Christ because we love him much more than life itself. Powerful statement, isn't it? And actually a really sobering thought. To love God more than my family, my comfort, my sleep, my job, my home, more than the air I breathe itself. I honestly don't know if I'm willing to personally say that statement just yet, but boy, do I continue to daily pray to enter that place of such obedient surrender to God. This surrender is put on display through so many believers who are boldly following Jesus around the world. It reminds me again of another story of an amazing woman whose name is Helen Bahani. She's from Eritrea, a tiny country in North Africa that I had never heard of until I came across her story. She spent two and a half years locked inside a metal shipping container because she was unwilling to stop sharing her faith. In Eritrea, the desert is the prison. They place metal shipping containers in the desert and cram them full of 20 plus people. There's not enough room for everyone to sleep at the same time. So people have to take turns. And if you're unlucky enough to be on the outside of the group in the middle of the day and your skin touches the edge of the container, it burns straight to the edge. On occasions when she was caught singing gospel songs, the guards would strip her, take her outside and force her to kneel on the rocky ground and threatened to beat her. One time, the guards did this. They questioned Helen. Helen, where is your Bible? She replied, I do not have one. They asked her again, Helen, where is your Bible? 
Again, she replied, I do not have one. Then the guard finally asked Helen, is your Bible in your head? She responded, yes, I carry the Bible in my head. Then the guard reacted, well, we're going to have to beat it out of you then. He grabbed a wooden baton and he began to beat Helen. But halfway through the beating, Helen stopped and she looked straight into the eyes of that guard. And she said, I do not hate you, for you are carrying out an order. But you need to know that I am carrying out an order too, and that is not to deny Jesus Christ. So carry on. The guard continued to beat her, and they threw her back into the metal shipping container. Helen, on the brink of death, laid herself out in that moment before the Lord, and she began to worship God. She said, thank you, Lord, for the cold nights. Thank you for the hot days. Thank you for the bugs that bite my skin. Thank you, Lord. You see, Christianity in and of itself wasn't illegal in Eritrea. What was illegal was sharing the gospel. For Helen to be released from this prison, all she had to do was sign a piece of paper saying that she would never share the gospel again. But sign that piece of paper, she never could. For in the words of Helen, she would always say, Jesus Christ is the medicine of the world and he must be shared. So powerful. You see, obedience, a we, whether like or unlike Helen's story, willing to share Jesus no matter the cost. I believe the divide between what you and I know as the persecuted church and us as the free church here is actually no much more than one's willingness to evangelize, no matter the culture, context, or cost. And could it be that if we're not experiencing some form of persecution in our lives, it's because Jesus can't be seen or heard from our lives? You see, this kind of surrender is always and ever propelled by such a deep love. It is this kind of relentless love that drove Jesus Christ to the cross and for generations has catalyzed believers to count not their lives unto death because of foremost their unending and unreserving love for Jesus and their unconditional love for the people groups that they are trying to reach with the gospel. The same gospel that ultimately removes death from the equation. The love of Christ and the love for the people of their nation compels these believers to stay even in hardship so that their home may have the opportunity to through their lives encounter that same love that has transformed them, the love of Jesus Christ. You see, this is the incredible message of hope that is birthed from the persecuted church. Every day, love triumphs over fear, faith over suffering. And what if following Jesus really cost us something? Something maybe more than our Sundays not getting to be together. At the moment, if I was in the position, as so many pastors are around the world at times, where they're experiencing people rejecting them as they're trying to reach them with the gospel, even at times the people they're trying to reach are burning their churches to the ground, I think I honestly would move to a different field out of either fear or even just a desire to see fruit somewhere else. But the question I feel then I need to ask myself is, am I being propelled in obedience by love or by comfort? Do I only say yes to God when it suits my schedule for the day and my convenience? Or does the love for the people I'm called to reach propel me to follow Jesus no matter the cost? In 2 Timothy 3.12, it states, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That is a quite clear and intense scripture, one that for us here in Australia can challenge us more than any other scripture. I heard one story recently that has struck my heart and, and honestly continues to echo in my head every day. A man and his wife from Iran were believers and were offered a job in the United States. It was an amazing opportunity. So they took it and they moved there After being in the United States for only a short period of time, 
the wife began to plead with her husband for him to take her back to Iran. The husband was surprised by her request. I mean, think about it. Who wants to move back to Iran? Especially for her under all sorts of oppression, where the sharing of your faith could mean the end of your own life or brutal incarceration or all sorts of horrible things. I mean, who wants to willingly do that? Who would want to leave the a place of safety in the United States and go back to the horrors of Iran. However, the woman told her husband, I must go back to Iran. For here in the US, I can feel myself falling under Satan's sleepy lullaby. That little story disturbed me. For this woman was discerning a threat to her faith that was greater, a much greater threat than the kind of persecution that is occurring in Iran. And that threat was complacency, a lack of passion, laziness. That is ultimately more dangerous than persecution. During this time we are in, I see we each individually as well as corporately have two options. We can so easily and quickly retreat into ourselves, become complacent, turn to Netflix and comforts and use this season for our own pleasures. Or instead, We could fix our attention towards Christ, to our pursuit of him in our empty schedules, to get to know God. The persecuted church, despite limitations and restrictions, always finds a creative way to gather and commune, to fellowship, whether in secret, by media platforms, or even simply in faith through prayer. The persecuted believer thrives in the midst of the storm as they are uplifted by one another and encourage to press on. So, brothers and sisters here in Australia, I want to encourage you today in this with actually a few things. How can you build the church in this time? Can you find creative ways to love your neighbor, your church family? Could it be simply through something like a phone call or a kind text? Are you willing to remember as well your persecuted brothers and sisters in this time? to lend an ear to their story and be willing to learn from them. It is difficult for us in this time and the same situation happens for them with the added and continued pressure of persecution for their faith. Are we willing to not let their stories be in vain, but be humble enough to learn from their radical lives of faith as we all follow Jesus in our own context? Are you willing to pray for these brothers and sisters as well, that they would be encouraged and creative and strengthened during this season, that they would feel the presence of God deeply and have opportunities to make him known in their wider communities? And would you be willing to consider joining hands with them? These same brothers and sisters who during this time are struggling with their faith, but continuing to press on, to make sure that no part of the body is lacking, that we would then become a biblical community devoted to one another, whether they are part of the family of God in your neighborhood here in Australia or in the neighborhood of North Korea or Afghanistan or Somalia. You see, persecution doesn't actually stop around the world simply because we're all in isolation. People still to this day don't get access to food or medicine simply because they are Christians. This is something I would love to encourage you all to pray about and consider today. You have a chance to partner with Open Doors to help ensure the church is encouraged and strengthened and thriving around the world in this season. You can subscribe to the survival of the persecuted church for only $39 a month. This subscription enables you to have a relationship with the global church. It enables open doors to come alongside churches all over the world to make sure that they can can continue to be the light and hope of Jesus in their communities. It also enables you to be strengthened and encouraged in your own faith in Jesus hearing stories like that of Wong Ming Dao and that of Helen Bahani. You see, these are just two of thousands of stories that are out there in the world. People just like you and me 
who are trying to follow Jesus the best way they can. They can teach us so much. You see, Paul writes in Corinthians, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is if the church won't help the church, then who will? And so in a time of need where we realize we may be in need more than ever, can you imagine the persecuted church? And so I want to encourage you to consider subscribing to the survival of the persecuted church. If right now you're on your laptop or a mobile phone and you feel that, yes, I actually want to be a part of this. I want to join hands with my brothers and sisters and champion them in their own context. Just go to the search bar and type in opennoise.org.au forward slash subscribe. There you have the opportunity to become a monthly partner with this ministry. I truly believe that you won't regret the sacrifice, but you will instead come to see the privilege of partnering as you see their stories encourage your faith and give you tools to endure the hard times as we walk following the Lord. We are all standing together in faith in this season in particular. We each are facing our own challenges and struggles, but let us never forget the cost that so many believers around the world pay daily. The cost that is much more than maybe for some of us a limited income or self-isolation or or missing out on a Sunday gathering with the wider church? Would we as the Australian church use this season as but a taste, as a reminder of the reality of over 260 million believers around the world who are persecuted for their faith daily? As we consider all this, I just want to take a moment and as a church, just take some time to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters together. So would you just close your eyes and pray with me? God, we just thank you so much that you are never changing, that you're always the same. That despite the situations and circumstances that happen around us, especially in this season of life, that we as a global church are in at the moment, that God, you are still good. You are still kind and you are still king. Father, we just thank you for our brothers and sisters around the world who in this moment are continuing to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel. We just ask that you would right now strengthen and encourage them as they walk firmly in faith. And Father, we ask that even in our own situation and context that you would teach us how to live more boldly for Jesus. We just thank you that we can learn from our lives and we can support them that No matter how far apart we are, we can be one body and one faith group serving one God. And we just ask that you would encourage and strengthen us in this time, God, that we would not forget our brothers and sisters and we would be aware of their testimonies and allow it to encourage us. Would you just bless this church community as well, God, that they would feel fellowship, that they would feel your presence in this time. We just thank you for all these things. In your precious name. Amen. Well, I just want to thank you all for your time today. It's been such a pleasure being with you all. I hope that in the midst of everything happening, you guys are still feeling so connected and um, you're hearing from the Lord and and you're in the scriptures and being encouraged. But I want to thank you so much for taking the time to hear the stories of your brothers and sisters around the world and know that they are praying for you in this time. But we look forward to being with you again and can't wait to hear more from you and how this encouraged you. Be sure to even shoot us an email and let us know how this um, message spoke to you today. But we just pray for you guys and we bless you and we talk, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.
Wow, church, isn't it amazing to be reminded of the global church that we are not alone, that we have many brothers and sisters overseas who are part of the persecuted church. And it's so, so important to always be reminded of our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ and to be praying for them, to be supporting them, but particularly be supporting them through our prayers. And that was a tremendous message that we heard from Ali Hunter there. And it just puts some context to our faith. Let's, let's, I love that. Let's be mentored. Let our persecuted brothers and sisters in the pers global persecuted church be our mentors and lead the way when it comes to following Jesus and when it comes to Christian discipleship. Would you be praying for the persecuted church this week? If 
you want more information about today, which is the International Day of Prayer for the, for the Persecuted Church, why don't you head to uh, the Open Doors website, which is opendoors.org.au, and you can find out all the information there about how you can support, you can download resources, and we can get educated and informed about what's really going on around the global church, and in particular, the persecuted church. Thanks for being with us today. God bless you. Bye-bye.